Hi and welcome. This is the first set of slides dealing with uh, spatial analytical concepts and basically what I wanted to do is start by presenting some vocabulary so we're all on the same page and stressing what is special about spatial in spatial analysis and spatial data science. So what is spatial analysis? You may be familiar with this map. This is a classic map. This is the poster child of spatial analysis, so to speak. It's the map by John Snow of cholera outbreaks or cholera deaths, actually, in 1984 in London. And he came up with this point here, the pump in Broad Street, which he um, associated as the source of the outbreak. Now, there's a whole literature about whether or not this was actually spatial analysis. That's beside the point. But we see many examples of this today. This is an example from a couple of years ago with a map. This appears in the paper in the Chicago Tribune on a regular basis, and it shows the occurrences of homicides in a particular period of time. So we have spatial information, location, uh, and we try to make some sense out of that. So that is really what spatial analysis is about. It's not just making a map, but it's going beyond the mapping, adding value. So as my good child spells it out, transformations, manipulations, and application of analytical methods to spatial data, where spatial means geographic. Actually, there is a broader meaning of spatial that goes beyond geographic, for example, using network spaces, but we'll, we'll get to that later. So spatial analysis is really seen as part of a process of geospatial knowledge discovery. And uh, knowledge discovery from data is an important um, subject in computer science, particularly in the database world, where the acronym is KDD, Knowledge Discovery from Databases. And the idea is that you start with raw data, you turn it into information, which then evolves into knowledge and possibly into wisdom. That's kind of tongue in cheek, the last one. But the main um, transition here is to get from the raw data to something that can be analyzed and to some insights from that analysis. That's the knowledge part. What is spatial analysis or spatial analytics involved with? Well, four big topics as, as I see it. First of all, where do things happen? So we want to find where are the patterns, where are the clusters, hotspots, disparities? What is the location uh, of these things? Why do they happen where they happen? You know, what, what are the decisions behind this? What are the causal mechanisms behind this? How does what happens in one location affect what happens in other locations? So how does where things happen affect other things, the context, the environment, and vice versa? There's an interaction going on. And that concept of interaction is critical in spatial analysis. And then a fourth component is the optimization component, the normative component. Uh, for example, where should you put medical clinics? Where should you put fire stations? That's an optimization problem. So how is that different from any other analysis, you might wonder? And why is it called spatial analysis? What is special about the spatial stuff? So. One thing that is very different in spatial analysis is that we have two types of information. One pertains to the geography, to the location. The other pertains to the regular values, the variables that we're all used to, and that's called attribute information. So the critical part is the combination of location with attribute information. In non-spatial analysis, location doesn't matter and that's called locational invariance. Basically what that means is you can shuffle things around in space and the outcome is the same. Whereas in spatial analysis, you change the location, the information content changes. So what you learn from the data changes when the location changes. So let me illustrate this. Um, this is some real data, some census data 
um, that gives the percentage African American in tracts. And the uh, city in question is Milwaukee uh, in the Midwest. Uh, some of you may know that Milwaukee is actually the most segregated city in the US. So one of these maps is fake and one of these maps is real. Um, so one of these maps shows the actual spatial distribution of African Americans in the city. The other map is a random map, has basically taking the same numbers and randomly reshuffled them. So obviously these two maps are different. That's you know what we are concerned with in spatial analysis. However, if you just make the histograms, they're the same. The histogram is an aspatial analysis technique. The histogram doesn't tell you anything about um, what is where. And the histogram doesn't tell you anything about the physical spatial segregation pattern in the city. What it tells you is that there's lots of tracts with no African Americans and lots of tracts with predominant African Americans and not so much in between, but it doesn't tell you where this happens. In contrast, obviously the map does. Um, I have to tell you the map on the right is the true map, as you see the African American population concentrated in the center city. The map on the left is fake. Um, another technique that we'll see later is a spatial autocorrelation technique and specifically how you can show it in a graph. Uh, the graph on the left is flat, showing no relationship whatsoever. In other words, uh, spatial randomness. The map, the graph on the right shows a very steep uh, positive slope, very strong spatial autocorrelation, meaning similar values are in neighboring locations. Um, here's another example of aspatial versus spatial analysis. So let's focus on the right first. This is a box plot or box and whiskers plot of the distribution of rents in suburbs in New York City. And we'll talk about this later, what exactly this graph means if you're not familiar with this. But these observations above this line, this line is called a fence, um, are called outliers. So from the aspatial graph, the box plot, we see that there are six observations that are really extreme in terms of rent. But we don't know where these are. In the graph on the left, which is called a box map, which we'll also see uh, next week actually, uh, we find that these high rent um, locations are in Manhattan. Now, if you know anything about New York City, you said, yeah, so what? I knew this already. But that's not what this is about. This is about learning from the data. You know nothing about New York City. You're from Mars. You do this analysis. Here, you know, okay, there's some high rent areas in New York City. Here, you know where they are. And moreover, you find out that they're all next to each other, which is not something you would expect a priori. So spatial analysis is all about focusing these kinds of locational questions. So what do we do? We start very simple by showing interesting patterns and in mapping and geovisualization. Then we go a little further and we try to discover them in what I call exploratory spatial data analysis. And then we move into the modeling. Now in this course, we won't do much modeling. Uh, modeling is all about explaining and optimization, simulation, prediction, causation. Uh, we won't get there. We will focus on the first two aspects, the exploratory parts, and there's plenty to do in that, uh, as we'll see. So then what is spatial data science? That's kind of a new term, and it really is an, an, an aspect of computational social science. And computational social science has uh, started to view computation as a third approach to scientific discovery in addition to experimentation and observation. So there's new techniques that are being used, simulation techniques, machine learning, data mining, visual data exploration. These are all common buzzwords that come out of computational social science and an interface between statistics and computer science. And then 
while we have this computational part, we also have another part that is kind of feeding, feeding the frenzy, which is the data, the data-driven science. And some people have referred to this as the fourth paradigm, um, the availability of massive new data sets. And in particular in industry, these massive new data sets came from Web 2.0, um, driven by industry, large companies like Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Google have access to enormous amounts of data and they use it for marketing, recommended systems and so on. So not all that is directly necessarily relevant to social science re research, but a lot of it is and the two kind of feed off each other in that insights from computational social science go into the commercial sector and then social science also learns from the commercial sector, oftentimes in the form of very rich data sets. And there's some two important sources in this respect. This on the left is an article laying out what is meant by computational social science in uh, science. Um, and as a few years ago, <clears throat> and on the right is a book that um, basically defines data intensive scientific discovery as the fourth paradigm. And interestingly enough, it's written by a number of people at Microsoft Research. So not academia, but the industry research branch. So what is data science then? Uh, just many definitions out there. One that I like is a, uh, it consists of a statistical computing and how, and this is important, it's not just computing, it's how to access, transform, manipulate, explore, visualize and reason about data. So there you see again this knowledge discovery aspect of data science. And this Venn di diagram, you may be familiar with it, it's, it's been out there for a few years, and it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. Data science is the unicorn, so to speak, it's the center of everything. It's the act interaction between hacking or software skills, mathematics and statistics, and substantive expertise. And all three contribute, and the, um, the kind of distinction of data science is that any other two, any combination of just two of these is insufficient. You know, you have traditional research, which is mathematics, statistics with sub substantive expertise. You have machine learning, which is a merger between software, computational aspects and math and statistics. And then what they call a danger zone, tongue in cheek, is where people with substantive expertise try to do computation or vice versa, computer scientists try to get into substantive issues and but really the data science is the merger of all three and so this is often forgotten oftentimes the focus is just on the software part or on the math and the stats part but substantive knowledge is very important as well what is spatial data science and you know um, I had to come up with this definition for an encyclopedia so I might as well stick with it. I see it as a subset of generic data science, so it's part of data science, but it focuses on the special characteristics of spatial data, the importance of where. So data science is often referred to as the science of extracting meaningful information from data. And it's important to make a difference between standard data science applied to spatial data, which you see a lot of, and spatial data science. Um, in standard data science, spatial information is just an additional variable, but uh, the same methods are being used. But true spatial data science treats location, distance, and spatial interaction as core aspect of the data, and therefore employs specialized methods and software to store, retrieve, explore, analyze, visualize, and learn from such data. So that's the important distinction. So data science is, uh, spatial data science relate to data science as spatial statistics to statistics, spatial databases to databases, and geocomputation to computation. So this is actually a very important distinction, and a lot of people um, miss this part, and they think just because you use latitude and longitude in a machine learning algorithm, that makes it spatial analysis, but it does not, you know. 
uh, using the location, the relative positioning, distance, interaction as part of the methodology. So it changes your methodology. That is really what makes it spatial data science. And um, the data science process, just uh, this is from a very um, useful little book in the R uh, world, but it, it has this flowchart where you start, you start with the raw data, you clean them up, and then you have this circular interaction between visualizing, transforming, modeling, until you get some insight, and then you have to communicate that insight to the world. Um, what's involved in spatial data science? A lot of different things. So some of this we will cover, some of this we will not. So data manipulation, munging, wrangling, that's what this week's lab is all about. Uh, data integration is part of that, combining data from different sources. Then the exploration, pattern recognition associations, we spend a lot of time on that, visualization. Modeling is important, but we won't spend much time on that in this course. And an important aspect of this is that all these different tasks tend to involve different software tools. So it's important to be eclectic in your use of software tools and not just stick with one particular tool and try to do everything in that tool. You know, In this class, we will be using Geoda, which I developed, and all the labs and examples will be using Geoda, but you can equally well do much of this in R, not all of it, but much of this, or in Python. So um, what you'll learn as you do more applied data science is that you end up using a combination of all these different software tools. And some things are better for some actions than for other actions. So let me close with a little example of some work I did several years ago with Sarah Williams from MIT. We were uh, thinking about this concept of a digital neighborhood. So we used data from Twitter and Foursquare in New York City for a week, and we had the actual uh, fire hose data. So we have everything, not the, just a sample. And we ended up using basically a little over half a million tweets and Foursquare check-ins um, from our raw data. Uh, Foursquare doesn't exist anymore, but it was a locational rating service. Um, so basically, what did we have to do? So these Twitter messages are JSON files. We'll talk about that in the lab. And so we had to convert them from that format to comma separated files that we could manipulate. There were almost 6,000 files, little files, and more than 5 million messages, taking up more than 20 gigabytes of memory. So to manipulate that, we actually used Python. You could also do it in R. Then we converted the text files to a spatial database. We used PostGIS, which is an extension of Postgres database. We aggregated the points to block group totals. Uh, we used PostGIS. You could also do it in R. Now you can actually also do it in Geoda. And then finally, we ran some statistics, which we'll see later in the course. A local spatial autocorrelation, local Moran statistics, and then we visualized that and ended up with this cool little map which shows hot spots in red and cold spots in dark blue and identified some things that we call spatial outliers, places that are very different from their neighbors. And so basically, this is the upshot of the process. So what I wanted to do in this initial set of slides is just throw some terminology at you. Um, force you to start thinking about the difference between spatial analysis and just regular analysis and start thinking about really what is special about spatial because this is really what this course is all about.